So we are now to the fourth out of fifth pieces in our discussion today. Thank you for staying tuned in. This la uh, fourth piece is titled A la manière de violon by Raymond Lucheur, and that translates to In the Manner of the Violin. More about that later. A little bit about Lucheur, he was born in 1899 and he died in 1979. He's a well-acclaimed composer and teacher, and he studied under Nadia Boulanger and Vincent Dandy, so you may recognize some of those names. His cantata won the Premier Grand Prize of Rome in 1928, and he was awarded the Bizet Prize in 1935. He was actually a predecessor to Landowski, so he also held public office. He was the chief inspector of musical education and then later the inspector general of state education in 1940 and 1947, respectively. And then later on, he went to be the director of the Paris Conservatory for six years, starting in 1956. So three major roles there that he played. He um, composed works for flute, harp, orchestra, chorus, chamber groups, and obviously piano. Locher's music is lyrical, yet unashamedly uses chromaticism. So I really love that statement, unashamedly uses chromaticism, and we'll definitely talk about that also a little later. Also want to just include a small personal note. Why did I include this piece? When I was going through, there's 27 pieces total, as I mentioned. Um, this title really stood out to me. Um, I actually am a violinist as well as a pianist. And so when I saw this title, In the Manner of the Violin, I was just intrigued. How can we bring the violin to the piano? What is he talking about? How is this going to work? And so that really uh, you know, got my interest up and then I um, started studying it and it actually fell in line with my mini collection um, with my graduated levels of pieces. So I just wanted to point that out. It's, it's a very personal piece to me as well as falling into this collection that we are creating together. Throughout music history, the piano has been known to take on various roles such as mimicking the human voice, various orchestral instruments, the horn call sound for hunting, sounded for hunting in the English countryside. Even percussion instruments. You might have a few more that you could add to my list here. There's examples found in many composers' works. Bach, Chopin, Messiaen, um, also a French modern composer. As indicated by the title of this piece, our focus today imitates the violin. So let me just give you a quick review of the violin. Some of you are already familiar with the instrument and some of you might need a little bit of a, wait, what was this about exactly? The violin's four strings are traditionally tuned a perfect fifth apart. So we start with a low G on, this would be G below middle C is its lowest string, just to kind of give you a gauge of how the lowest pitch would sound on a violin. So the composer uses this interval of a fifth frequently in this composition. He also uses its inversion, which is the fourth. So a fifth, for example, from the G string up to the D string there, that perfect fifth. And then the inversion of the fifth, of course, would be the perfect fourth. So those two intervals are used prominently throughout this piece. And then, going back to my quote earlier, he juxtaposes those two intervals with the minor second chromaticism everywhere. So there's examples of this. If you look right here in the first measure with me, and also in the fourth measure, you see the left hand presenting. Now notice this is treble clef, even though it's the left hand. The notes G and D, and then A and E. So two intervals of a perfect fifth side by side. Not only are they the perfect fifth intervals we discussed, they're also representing the lower and upper pairs of open strings on the violin, the G and D, and then the open A and E string. So this would be the complete set of violin strings with the traditional tuning. Now, measure 27 and 29, also in this example, you see the left hand's two intervals of a perfect fourth, also again, treble clef, but the left hand is playing here. You see those intervals of a perfect fourth there on the bottom. And then they coincide with the right hand. Now, this is a sixth interval. We have F, F sharp up to D there. And then that interval, looking at the eighth note, rhythms there in the right hand moves up to F sharp, excuse me, G and D. So from F sharp and D, the sixth, to G and D, the perfect fifth. So we have that recurring juxtaposition, fourth and fifth side by side in those measures. Present are the perfect fifth, it's inversion, and then notice that he goes from the perfect sixth 
or excuse me, the major sixth to the perfect fifth with that half step at the point of resolution there. So that's just a perfect little in a nutshell of those points there. And then we have the rolled chords of the right hand. Now this is at measures 42 through 45, and also again at measures 47 through 49, and these are shown. These are also idiomatic of the violin's double stop technique. So if you're not familiar with the violin, we have the bow is able to reach two strings at once. We can't play all four strings with one bow stroke, but you can get two strings in one bow stroke. That's called a double stop there, two strings. So um, you have also the idea of triple and quadruple stops. We have four strings. Obviously the bow cannot play all four strings at one time. It's too big a distance for the bow to do in one stroke. But we kind of have this rolled chord arpeggio brink there. So I'll play a quick excerpt on the violin so you can see what I'm talking about. So you'll notice the use of the intervals of a perfect fourth, E to A, and the perfect fifth, that same A up to E again. We're reflecting those two uppermost strings of the violin. And an interesting correlation here is that the arpeggiated harmony chosen in measures 42 and 43 specifically is easily translated to the violin through those open A and E strings. From a violinist perspective, even the beginning six bars could be played on this instrument by using that double stop technique of bowing two strings at a time. I'm going to pause here now and let us listen to this entire piece and we'll come back and do a little bit more discussion. As I mentioned, there's a lot of chromaticism that is really indicative of Landowski's style as a composer. Here in this piece, we have chromatically altered thematic material or sequences that we're going to focus on for a few moments. So the piece begins with motion propelled by half steps really in both hands, shown in the score excerpt. So measures one through five in the left hand, we're seeing that G, G sharp, A, and then back to A flat the enharmonic of G-sharp, and returning to our initial G there. So these are chromatic pitches under the tied D, all in the left hand. And so we have above that, in measure two, the right hand half step motion goes through measure two, it repeats in measure four, the same A and E there, and then it moves that A to a B flat, up that half step. So the right hand's chromaticism is, is not as big a motion, but you see a slight shift in that bottom right hand note. So it's kind of fun to me to notice on this part that especially uh, the left hand, where you would have the G, G sharp, A, A flat, G. In my ears as a violinist, that sounds like 
me tuning. And a lot of times as violinists, we like to play two strings at a time to really hear the, the um, relative pitches there. Is that a perfect fit? And so the you know, kind of sound as we're adjusting the pegs or the fine tuners. I feel like that's what he's doing. It's a little tune-up session there. And then on the A and the E string, you hear just like the A. Oh, I'm not quite sure if that A is in tune. And so I shift it up just a little bit, a little bit more sharp. Oh, wait, OK, that's that's B flat too far. And I go back down. So I, I found it really amusing. I was just kind of grinning to myself as I was playing this on the piano because I was totally hearing this through the ears of a violinist. OK, so anyway, back to our chromaticism. Lucia returns to this thematic idea of chromaticism by using transpositions and inversions of this three half step pattern that I just introduced in measure one. So measures 41 through 44 is where we're going to focus. And we're leading later to a flourish of half steps on the downbeat of measure 45. So using the left hand's chromatically ascending pitches in the first measure seen above, and the example 4-3, as a motive, notice that the pattern is now turned upside down in measure 41. So instead of ascending, we're finding that the notes are descending. This is shown here in the example on the screen. And then this motive is also transposed, beginning with a minor third above the initial G from measure 1. We're now starting with B flat. The final four measures of this work again focus on the motive beginning in the right hand. And so this is shown below. And measure 59 moves the motive from the right hand to the from the right hand to the left hand. And we have the final E flat leads to a half step resolution, E flat to D in measure 60. So the composer is actually connecting the first and the last measures of the piece with the left hand's open fifth statement of G and D. Again, those open strings on the violin. The left hand does show other cases where chromatic movement is of high importance. The left hand's the lowest voice is outlining, out, excuse me, outlining a sequence of half and whole steps in measure 12 through the downbeat of measure 14, G, A flat, A, B flat and C. So look at the lowest, the down stem note. You can follow that progression there with me. Then this pattern shown in example 4 6 is repeated almost exactly as a transposition. So you see right below that the second musical excerpt beginning a half step higher at measure 19. So you see again the down stem notes G sharp, A, B, C, and then the last measure, D there. So if you put those two together, looking at the first measure of both examples, you see G in the first example, and then the second example is G sharp. So you see that it's just shifted up that half step. Meanwhile, the right hand's upper notes in the same bar, still looking at the same examples, um, reveal a complementary half step motion that then finishes the musical statement with the intervals of a perfect fourth. So I'm looking on the second system of that previous example, and you see half-step motions there. I believe it's B to C on the very first one. And then linking this to some French repertoire, Debussy's Fireworks from Preludes book number two is where I'm going to point your attention at this time. Students will find that identifying and successfully handling sequences that are altered by transposition are skills also needed in this more advanced piece. The two upper staves that I'm showing you in the example introduce a system that is manipulated by neighboring intervals of a second, chromaticism. So in this case, the changing upper voices are indicated with the up stem while the repeating inner voices have a down stem. So just kind of giving you a little bit of a view. We're just a snapshot, so I'm trying to explain here. Notice how the notes in the second staff repeat the notes from the upper staff an octave lower. In the first two bars, the sequence moves in half steps. The upper voice is moving down a minor second. So we have a C sharp to B sharp. And then up a minor second, C sharp to D. But in the following two bars, the composer transposes that passage. So we're beginning a fourth higher at F sharp. This is measure 59, initiating a whole step motion moving down a major second. So F sharp down to E. And then we finish here with a major second up, G sharp 
and then it descends a whole step to F sharp. So not only is there a transposition of the pitches, but also an enlargement of the original half step interval to a whole step. And so this is, uh, of course, a much more complicated work by Debussy using the same skill. A pedagogical note, you heard this in the recording, I did not want to neglect to speak about this, is there are obviously repeated 16th notes as a featured rhythmic motive with, throughout this work. The function of, this, of these notes alternates. Sometimes they have an accompanimental role, and other times it's a melodic role. So it's important for the student to understand the difference between these two primary roles, as well as how to implement the techniques required for each. So I could spend a whole other session just talking about this particular focus of the piece, but I'm going to mention it because there's a contemporary example um, in Ravel's piece where you have this ever-present 16th rhythm, and this is found in the Takata from the Tomb of Kupura, again by Ravel, and it also has a similar function to those in Lushur's piece, so I'm going to show you here on the screen. And the final outcome of Ravel's piece, these passages, should be a clear layering of textures, resulting in an easily heard counterpoint at the eighth note, accompanied by the rhythmically active sixteenths. And as we conclude our fourth piece here, for what students would this piece be appropriate? So I'm thinking at least an upper intermediate level student would find this piece within their grasp. Pupils at this level, we're thinking they've already encountered some balancing issues be between the hands. They probably have experience with chromaticism from previous studies and have also addressed the idea of alternating fingering, which is something that will come up in this piece. The use of basic intervals, perfect fourth, perfect fifth, intervals of a half and a whole step, there's, creates this comfortable reach for the hand, so that's very doable. The range of this piece covers the middle to upper registers of the piano encompassing about two and a half octaves total. As a result, the student is not required to play in the lower registers or to even read the bass clef. Remember, the violinist doesn't read the bass clef either, so he obviously kept that in mind when composing this piece. No pedal is needed. The most complicated rhythm in this piece is the sextuplet. And although this piece is longer in length than the one I'm about to introduce as our final selection, the skill level here require, uh, the skill level required here, let me get that straight, uh, makes it accessible to a lesser advanced student than the fifth piece that I will introduce.